So, well, hi everyone, and welcome tonight to uh, round two of, I gotta hold it this way, King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table. And joining me is uh, our Strudel Kitty and Michael Coatney. And we are um, probably gonna get joined by the Van Spawn. I don't know where he is. He's late. My husband's over here saying, should I message Jonathan? Maybe you should, honey. Maybe he figured, oh, he's got his headphones in. He has to wear his headphones because otherwise he hears me and then he hears the delay. So Otherwise anyway. he wouldn't be as techie, right? It wouldn't be as much of a techie. Yes, that's right. <laughs> so in addition to Serignus, who is very happy to make an appearance tonight because there is mention of dragons in this mm. book. So he felt, although he was very concerned about the wingless dragon, he wasn't exactly sure how that worked. Yeah, but, I wore my dragon shirt. And that's God. perfect. That's perfect. In addition to that, I also have a sword. This is not exactly <laughs> the caliber. And the way that you can tell is because it's a bubble sword. Um, yeah, and I'm that, pretty that, sure that really, that yeah. was not a bubble sword, but it does have a scabbard. So the holes, I think I could have mistaken it for Exc Excalibur. Exactly. Possibly. So Mark really liked this section. So that's cool. Um, and he said he didn't really like the last one. I think it is. Oh, hey, Cloudfall. Hey, everybody. And, and Mark is like, what? You guys who aren't here, I can, I can host 10. So if you want to participate in the next um discussion let me know so i was telling strudel kitty before we started that i definitely should have divided this into two because there are eight stories in this book and i'm gonna have to give them all what my grandma used to call a lick and a promise which is hardly discussing them at all and just skimming over them and so this is one of those things where i would definitely say spend a little time go read over the little stories one at a time i do have to say strudel kitty has her her um her dragon shirt, I have a shirt sent to me by the fabulous Wendy Clark in Washington, who is a friend of mine, who after she saw the class where we had the discussion about the interrobang, sent me an interrobang shirt. So I have an interrobang shirt on and I'm totally in love with it. So, so on um, Wednesday morning, I realized that I hadn't read any of the book and that you had said that this was the longest section. <laughs> so I was up until like one in the morning both Wednesday and Thursday night. Um, this section, I mean, yes, I'm trying to take notes on it as I go through, but this section took me like three and a half hours to read. Like this isn't, yeah, and I'm a very fast reader. So what we've got going tonight are these um, eight stories so in book two. So I wrote down the story and what I think the main thing of the story is, oh, here's Jonathan. Who wants to call himself Van Sun instead of Van Spawn, which isn't nearly as cool. Um, okay, so we have the first story, Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, whose main theme I think is honor. The first quest of Sir Lancelot, also honor. Sir Gareth, or the Knight Kitchen Knight, I, which I think is a theme of identity. And then Tristam and Isolt, which is love, question mark. Like, is this really love? And this theme, which are ain't needed, love. And then Gowan and Lady Ragnall, I think you're seeing a theme here. Um, that theme, I think, goes back to honor. And then Percival, Purity, and Lancelot and Elaine, love again with a question mark. I think you see that um, there's a theme. So that's- Oh, it's honor, doing. honor, maybe love, maybe love, maybe love, honor, maybe honor, love. honor. I Mark feel like just said in chat, I deem now sword X extremely good at blowing bubbles caliber and that makes me happy yes mark thank you so much we definitely think that is a comment worth highlighting so one thing i will say is i there is an old song from the 80s i'm gonna put it in the chat that i feel like is the theme song of this book of the book and it is called um, tainted love by a group called soft cell and i feel like this this chap this section is this so Marilyn Manson did a cover of that. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, okay, well, I love that song. I'm back in the OG. So um, in the very beginning of this book, one of the first things it says is that the evil was always breaking in to attack the good. And I think this is a key theme in 
Arthurian legend and perhaps all of literature and maybe even life that no matter how good every, oh, you guys know that song. All right. Um, <laughs> no matter how good, well, uh, Jay Khan, I, I love your mom. So I think no matter how good everything is going, even if everything is wonderful in your life, it's like, just like with a lawn and weeds are always trying to get in, the evil is always trying to break in. So that's a thing. And then also there, this is both on page 93, but it says that, which is the first page of this. It says that, but year by year, the fame of his court grew and spread far and wide. And the bravest and noblest knights in the world came to his court and strove by their deeds of courage and gentleness to win a place at the round table. And I think here we have the second key idea, which is that there's this human desire where we crave to be a part of something bigger than us. We want to be a part of a movement. We see this in Star Wars. We see this in Harry Potter. We see this in essentially every Hunger Games. Like you see it in basically everything, right? Um, and so I wrote, oh, I've kind of, I've smudged my dry erase. But I think these are the two main themes here, which is that evil was always breaking in and this craving to be a part of something bigger than us. And then I wrote sideways and then kind of smudged it, honor. All of this goes back to like honor. Um, and I'm, so that's like my extra idea. These two themes and then this idea of honor, we're just going to see over and over. Do any of you, whether in the call or in the chat, have any other thoughts about major themes that you saw here? Hmm. And that occurred to you? Or do you I think captured I'm everything. <laughs> By the way, if you saw me, I'm just getting it up so that I can uh, type in the chat if I need to. Okay, perfect. Um, so the it's interesting because okay. you see this, it starts right away. We've actually already seen it in the book, but we're going to see, um, this is on, if you have your book, we're on, uh, on page 94. It says that King Arthur held his Christmas feast at Camelot once a year with all the bravest of his knights about him and all the fairest ladies of the court. And I feel like in Arthurian legend, it is very clear that the most important characteristic in men is courage, and the most important characteristic in women is beauty. They're not at and all clear about this. It's not at all important. <laughs> I know. Amazing. And, and so I think how, in what ways has this changed over time? Like since this um, is, and how has it stayed the same? Like, is this, tone deaf in contemporary culture or is it how it really still is that we have these expectations of men and women still Any i think it's represent i think it's representation it's bad but as a societal commentary it could be sort of it is to be criticized whether that is because of good literature and satire or if it's because it's just bad yeah, I so think that I think that these are still social those, constructs, definitely. I think it's um not that much hasn't changed. Standards, but they are not good standards. No. But we still see them. Necessarily. Right. Or ones that people want to hold others to, just ones that kind of always end up resurfer uh, resurfacing. I think it's interesting when Clavel says, I think everything ties into honor really well and I think maybe that's the overarching word of this. What's interesting is how little honor there is in beauty, except for a couple of nights. We see this, um, okay, just listen to CBS Ideas, Botox Nation, yeah. But it's becoming more and more of a male thing too. And we do see that in a couple of the knights who are really objectified. Like Lancelot <laughs> is objectified, Galahad is objectified, you know. Sir Percival. Um, uh... Yes, Sir Percival where people just fall in love with them, this like fake love just based on how they look and they don't really care about them. Um, so this story, this first story of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight um, begins Everybody with the Green so Knight. Who's, oh, well, I enjoy not, this one. All of the characters are super shallow. <laughs> well, well, Sir, I mean, the Green Knight's most important characteristic is that he is, wait for it, green. I mean, yep. everything about him is green. His horse is green. His head, hair is green. His beard is green. His sword is green and gold. There's like green and gold. So he's almost like a knight leprechaun. Like, yeah, there's I was thinking like St. Patrick's Day themed. 
Yes, it is definitely St. Patrick's Day. I think it would be an awesome costume is to go as the Green Knight. Um, and he shows up at a Christmas feast and he has a mm -hmm. holly bow. Yes, Doodle Kitty, go ahead. I did want to say, just while we're on the topic of the greenness before we move on, I really like the way that they listed it too. Because they start with his vest and his armor, his pants, his shoes. And it gets to hair and skin last, like, because obviously. And you're just like, wait. No, he is riding a green horse. Green. <laughs> like, wait, he, he is green. green. His horse is green. Yeah, yeah. Like, way to hide the most important part. <laughs> like bear that was crazy i agree with you so um, you read it and then you go wait what wait he's actually in a really good twice. way well and they don't say that like later on there's like the blue knight and the red knight and the black knight mm -hmm. and they don't say that same thing about them like are they actually that color or is it just mm -hmm. their accoutrement be, i wonder if the, in older arthurian legend there was more repetition mm, with yeah. the with the red knight it mentions that not that he himself is hell he himself is red it mentions that he's the red knight of the red lawns and so then it mentioned that there was a fight and that the uh the grass got stained a darker shade of scarlet as if it was already red and with the blue knight so, they did mention that there was a, a certain plant covering the ground um i don't remember the name of the plant but probably some sort of poppy i think it was poppies with the red knight actually and red poppies and blood I want to highlight a couple of comments that are coming in, not related to color, but related to what we were talking about before. We have to remember that there's a little bit of lag for the people in the chat. So Mark's saying there's a blending wow. of important ideals with this, right? That men are often known for being beautiful and women for being brave. Um, yeah, we get, well, In we don't see really any brave women in these stories. There definitely are stories of brave women, but I don't think you could argue that. I, I think the bravest character in this whole book who is a woman is the damsel who rescues um, well, Gowan. I oh, know, that's right. You see some interesting... Or Lancelot, or whoever, yeah. When, if you're talking about the women in the stories, now admittedly, there's a lot of female villainess, like villains going on. There's some cluelessness going on. The one lady who's just like, why have you slain my husband? It's like, because he's right a bad after, dude. <laughs> right after he treacherously managed to set up a fight where his opponent had no weapons or armor. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is a true thing. I think a good observation of Dracon that um, basically pretty women trying to seduce good knights. And if the knights accept, they lose honor. But the woman who tries to seduce should be the one who loses honor. It's this trope that we see of like women as temptress, women as seductress, women as the evil like snake in the grass. And it really goes back to like Garden of Eden kind of thing. And yeah. Cloudfall says, you know, sometimes back, the women- like the Odyssey, there's a good deal of that. Right, yeah, well, yeah, the sirens, right? Although, so, and Kierke too. Uh, and yeah, I believe there's that, another, there was another one I was thinking of. Yeah. Um, so no. he shows up at this Christmas feast and he has this holly bough. And the holly bell was a symbol of fertility, of eternal life, often associated with magical powers. And he um, wants to know who's willing to enter into a very bizarre deal with him. So the deal is that they get to hit him with an ax. And then a year later, he gets to hit that person after they try to find him. It makes no sense. But Sir Gowan. Very macho, very, very uh, King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table thing. <laughs> Exactly. Oh, and Mark C figured out like Sirens of Greek mythology. So Sir Gowan decides to take him up on it because of his old shame unhealed, which you have to have read book one to know what we're talking about there. And Sir Gowan hits the Green Knight with his axe and cuts off his head. And then obviously, as one does, the Green Knight simply picks up his severed head and rides off with it under his arm. In when did a severed head ever prevent anybody from walking <laughs> off, right? Exactly. So we're going to ask the Magic 8-Ball how believable that is. So is that believable? And the Magic 8-Ball cannot predict now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, And then I love this line. It's on page 99. After this happens, um, on page 99, it says, it took a while before the hall um, was filled once more with laughter. Really? Like a party gets interrupted by a guy and he gets his head cut off and it takes a while for the party to start again. It's like 
so crazy. And so it's coming up on a year later. And I don't know if you guys noticed this, but throughout the stories, we get constantly these events are always happening surrounding these. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, this is so funny. <laughs> like, um, this is, a, yeah, just a normal commonplace event in the life of a night. Um, and I think Dracon has a really good idea here. I would have chopped off a fingernail, right? So that when he turns them out. But I think that we get this a lot where there's like everything surrounds religious holidays. It, everything's happening at the Feast of Pentecost, at Christmas, at Easter. Like everything is in religious festivals. And Gowan sets out and he ends up at this castle and he gets distracted by this beautiful woman cue basically every story in here and he says he'd rather keep his oath than be the ruler of the whole land so here's again that theme of honor showing up and the lord of the castle and gowan make this really interesting deal where the lord of the castle is going to give gowan everything he finds while he's out hunting that day and gowan is going to give him everything he gets and then in this weird like Joseph and the coat of many colors, Joseph and Potiphar's house, where Potiphar's wife is constantly trying to tempt him. Um, oh, Pentecost. Pentecost is that feast of where um, Christ's apostles were given the gift of tongues. And um, it is a religious holiday. I, I don't know all. It's a Christian holiday now. I don't know all that all Christian denominations celebrate it equally i think it's more emphasized in some over others but um it's, it's one of the more riotous christian holidays yes yes so more of a party. i mean if it's a feast day it kind of makes a sense feast day. yeah it's a feast day so his wife is like trying to tempt him like all of the women and she gets him to give her a kiss every day and he then gives the kiss to the Lord. And then the third day she gives him three kisses and this piece of green lace. All right, so was I the only one who thought of the scene from A Knight's Tale when I read this? Yes, like, yes. It's like Heath Ledger okay. sprung to life. Um, one I don't one know note I would I make about the it. kisses is that even though she's the one that a modern person describing the situation situation would say she's coming on to him, right? It always says he wins the kiss. This dude is doing everything in his power to avoid <laughs> this, but he wins the kiss. That's the phrasing that is used. But a kiss is okay. A kiss is okay. Yes, Nobody's he's okay. winning it. And and like, does he not get to lock his door? It's like every weird. morning, she shows up like clockwork in his room. There's no law. Hey. That's, that's actually a key point to make is that the castles that would have existed at this time period did not have many separate rooms. Mm. Oh, you see, I mean, what, even, what? Even, even if he did have one, this queen, she's just like, she's so strong. She just punches the door open. Some body. She goes, well, the, the castles you know were more defensive. Actually, they, were, they were very open inside in the sense of like, they didn't have separate mm walkable rooms everywhere for guests and stuff. It would be common, in fact, for a lot of people to be sleeping in the Great Hall. That's hmm. the biggest That's room. These, these castles I mean, it's the writer of Lancel and Green retelling, right? So he's presumably bringing it to a more more modern medieval well, period, I guess. But it's an important idea because one of the things that distinguished the lady of a castle, she was called the Chatelain, and the, they carried the keys. Um, the, the lady of the castle uh, always, like even like Eleanor of Aquitaine, right? That you would carry the keys. And so I guess maybe she has a key, so maybe he can't lock it, but surely he could like pull a dresser over in front of the door or something. I don't know. Strudel Kitty, go ahead. You don't have to raise your hand. You can just Oh, no, talk. I'm just trying to get the lighting to be fixed. I'm trying to stand in oh. front of the mirror so it doesn't do this. Oh, it's really not that big of a deal. Don't I'm a worry. scary shadow person. There we go. Yeah, okay. Yeah. My husband figured out what you're doing, but really it looks fine from here. Go hey, ahead. Aiden, welcome. Um, so then it turns out, because it's Arthurian legend, that the Lord of the Castle is actually the Green Knight. And he spares Gowan's life because, and 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 Gowan, I'm saying Gowan, it's often pronounced Gawain, but I have trouble saying yeah. that because I think it sounds weird. Um, so I say Gowan, but uh, which is wrong, but I like it better. So there you go. Um, 
but he he nicks his neck because he wasn't completely honest because he kept the green lace. Um, and I think this it's interesting because I'm curious what you guys think about this in the in the chat and in this in the group here. Um, why is this story one of the most famous of all the Arthurian legends? Like this one is one of the best known. If you know any story of Arthurian legend, it's Sir Gowan and the Green Knight. Hmm. I think it's kind, kind of, kind of it's pleasingly bizarre. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, it's very clean cut and well, um, put together. That's the word I was looking for. Um, very clean cut, well put together, easy to understand. I think the concept is very unique. Um, also, Dracon, they did have locks, but like even if they weren't the kind of locks that were like square and then had a little thing on top of them, they would be the kind of locks that you have in like bathroom stalls where you pick up the little stick and move it over, or they would be able to bar the doors, um, even if they didn't have a lock. With Doesn't a key require a lot of craftsmanship that. <laughs> Yeah, if you can make a stick and then attach another stick to it, I think you, I think you're good. I, th I think one of the things that comes up in this story is the idea that Gowan, he he's afraid for his life, so he keeps the lace and he isn't fully honest about it in the interest of self-preservation. But then he, it ends up like hurting him in the end, and and I think it's this this idea of honor that keeps coming up again and again. So Clapwell says, I feel like Gowan got off the hook too easily. He didn't pass on the most important gift, and yet the Green Knight is still accepting of it. Yeah, I th I think I agree with you. Like, yeah, definitely. He, he was lying. Like he he did break his honor. I I agree with you. Like that is yeah, I completely agree with you. Okay, so Dracon says this may be is why there are the perfect story elements: suspense, surprise, chopped off heads, and spooky scene. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, I think you pretty much cover yep. all of the possible <laughs> human story. So, and then this, mm -hmm. that's why, right? Love it, Dracon, that's awesome. So we'll move on to the next story. And I think you can already tell that we're not gonna get through all eight, but um, yeah. I think the next one- be longer. <laughs> I know, right? Or divide it up. My husband said, you know, just spill over into the next time, which is fine. Mm -hmm. um, the, so in the first quest of Sir Lancelot, this super wounded knight shows up with a sword sticking out of his head. And he tells this odd story about how the best knight in Logris is, oh, and, and Mark C says a little humor, which I think is right too, um, is gonna heal him. And it reminds me of this scene from this old TV show called ER. And there's a scene where the emergency room is really busy and this guy keeps coming up to the doctors asking for help. And they're like, just sit down and wait, just sit down and wait. And then finally, like the third time he does it, the doctor's like, just sit down and wait. And the guy says, okay. And he turns around and walks back to his seat. And as he walks away, they realize he has an arrow in his head. Yeah. And they're like, oh, wait, <laughs> you know? And this just reminded me of that. And Nimue shows up with this gorgeous guy, which is weird because it's usually supposed to be the girls who are pretty. Welcome back, Van Swan. And two other guys. And she tells Arthur that the gorgeous guy is Lancelot, her foster son. And then his name appears in gold and the, in the seat to the right of the Siege Perilous. And that, like, where the writing appears, what, like, to me, that was just like a Harry Potter moment. Yeah. Like, where the writing, <laughs> it was almost like when Dolores Umbridge was having the Ryan Pierre and Harry Sand. Like, it just felt like this magical mm. writing, which is also found in the Bible in the book of Daniel, where writing appears on the wall and he interprets it. But that idea of writing appearing is, is a trope that goes. Um, I think on page 120, we get a really important thing because. We get, um, like, while Arthur and Guinevere are making a lot of Lancelot, and they're super excited about Lancelot, and they're pretty sure that he's the knight Merlin was talking about who would be the best knight ever, it says, but they did not know that another new knight, Mordred, the son of Morgan Le Fay, also sat that day at the round table, who was to be the traitor at the still distant hour when the darkness should fall once more upon Logris. And I feel like that idea of like a Judas right in your midst at the same table as you mm. is like, is there any enemy more dangerous that the enemy than the enemy at your table? Mm. Um, I mean, 
come on, Arthur. Would you not suspect the son of your evil sister not to be a great guy? Right? Like, Arthur, I, well, you know what, though, Michael? That is Arthur's consistent problem is he's not <laughs> suspicious enough. Right. Yeah. If, if he had been a little more suspicious, he could have prevented the whole Guinevere Lancelot thing and just mm -hmm. cut off Lancelot's head and be done with it. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so Lancelot and his friends go off on their first quest and they promptly fall asleep in a field, a la Wizard of Oz. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they promptly fall asleep in a field. I know. <laughs> okay. They get up. Which is like, they walk outside. It's, Good night. I think I'm on a quest. I think it's time for now. So Lancelot ends up being taken to Morgan Le Fay's lair, told he has to marry one of the three witches who fall in love with him. And there's a super funny part where Lancelot says, a hard choice indeed to die or to choose one of you to be my love. Mm. <laughs> like, oh, Yikes. Yeah. Not very nice, no. Um, and I think it's like, to me, just disturbing. I mentioned it earlier, but like that there's this trope, continuing trope of just like falling in love. Oh, yes. I mean that name, <laughs> More <than laughs> it, like death, right? And then Kyle yeah. Paul, Lancelot, yeah, Lancelot, Lancelot. There's so yeah. many different spellings. One of the most common distant, um, different spellings we see is in one of the later stories, um, and the it is the Tristram, which mm, was yep. normally called Tristan, and yeah. it's and it's normally not. Isolt, it's normally Isolda. Um, oh. mm -hmm. Okay. But so there's that. So That's this like damsel called Lancelot. Lancelot. Oh, you're right, Jonathan. It was Lancelot, not Gowan. Um, Lancelot helps him escape and he rescues her father. And then he sets all the, the prisoners free, a la Jesus, right? Like there's this constant, <laughs> constant religious echo, constantly coming back to the religion and oh mark or uh, club right. thing like totally getting mordor vibes well you know where did tolkien get the stuff <laughs> <laughs> yeah he got those names from the same root sources but i think one key thing to give lancelot credit for if we're going to be calling him the best which we are for quite some time because percival's not born yet apparently we've also got gawain who's the best and percival who's also well, the best i was tracking well, the power rankings. the fairest and so and so's the fairest and all the people well, are the fairest no, in the, land. the power rankings have gotten far more consistent in this mm -hmm. whole segment it's just best bravest noblest so great worthy do most honor to knighthood <laughs> the only upset is gareth is we're talking about him later so no spoilers i guess but this, in this whole segment, there is a power trio of Lancelot, Gawain, and Tristram slash honorable mention to Percival and Galahad who aren't present. Like, yeah. But it is very consistent yeah. in this zone. But Lancelot makes one of the best moves we've seen so far. We're seeing an evolution in chivalry, potentially. They haven't really, they haven't quite got the hang of this and it's gonna cause them problems later, but Lancelot makes the first sensible caveated oath uh, he says i'm going to do this but as I'll, I'll do anything as long as it doesn't conflict with my <laughs> stuff. which that exactly right, hey. a lot of problems in the previous stuff so like we got to give lancelot credit he has invented the sensible oath mm. yes i nice. did read that and i was just thinking <laughs> that man they needed this earlier. <laughs> <laughs> people, people need to stop making these. I mean, I'm not a huge fan of those giant boilerplate contracts, but like they need a little, a little bit of that, right? No, well, let's go. I'll give Lancelot a cheer because that was a good move on Lancelot's part. You know what I thought put was a little... sort of funny? Merlin's all like, "All right, we're gonna have these great knights sometime in the future." Lancelot, Percival, Galahad, and then when these guys come along and they're named Lancelot, Percival, and Galahad, <laughs> and everyone's like, like, hmm, hmm. Like, <laughs> um, this is like, so funny. Like, well, I well, wonder. And Cloud Paul says, like, this is like so common, right? Like, when you, it's one of the reasons why I wanted to read this is because you have to read this. It's just like the Bible. You have to read it if you're going to understand any story told now. Including Star Trek. You're going to see them over and over and over again. Um, and then uh, he's the best at eating the most chicken, right? Like the whole story centers around the superlative, 
right? Like you have to be the yeah. best, the most beautiful, the fairest, the strongest, the bravest, the most dangerous, the, whatever. Yeah. The, yeah. <laughs> so Jonathan, I actually thought you were going to mention the chivalry in Lancelot pretending to be Sir Kay. Oh, that made a lot of sense to me, though. I am so, it was, I'm it was a win -win. so disappointed. Like, so Sir Kay, if I'm not entirely uh, mistaken, Sir Kay was Arthur's uh, foster, I mean, adopted older brother, right? Yeah. Because when I yeah. first, like, when he was first introduced, I was like, did I find a favorite character? <laughs> because this guy, he's just like, um, Arthur hands him the sword, and Sir Kay's just like, hey, Dad, look, I'm king of England. <laughs> and, then, and then his dad just goes, <laughs> oh, she sure. is the problem child. You, are, are you indeed the are, is You know, is that true? And he's like, yes. <laughs> and he makes him swear with his hand on the Bible, and then he's like, Arthur gave it to me. <laughs> oh, and they're all like, this. Arthur, <laughs> Arthur's okay, okay, just disgruntled for the entire I'm just rest so of the disappointed with this whole fact that Sir Kay, he just gets progressively worse, and I'm just, I'm sad. <laughs> like, Look at Mark, he's going to vote it maybe worse than Rankin. Do you guys remember this discussion? And oh, what? Uh, boy, Mark, that is a throwback. Really That's like an like OG it. reference right there. Rankin was one of yep. the characters in um, a story that we read almost a year ago. And there sure. was a whole trope going on because he was a loser. And <laughs> I actually have Rankins in my family. Um, and so we were making a joke about that. Wait, hold on, which story is this? Um, what one is it? Is Rankin Desiree's baby? Oh, that might be right. Yeah. Um, uh, I hate that story. So, oh no, Rankin was the dragon abuser Majesty. in His Majesty's Dragon. Yes, yeah, right. I knew the yeah, that's familiar. Right. Okay. So in Rankin sucks. Rankin yeah. sucks. Down, Down with Rankin. As much Down as with Rankin. Yeah. So, so um, in in Sir Gareth of the Night of the Kitchen, I think we get mm -hmm. this really. To me, this is one of the most interesting stories because this guy shows up, and Sir Kay, who is like a bad guy, we just discussed it. He ends up being treated really badly by Sir Kay. Sir Kay ends up treating this guy really badly, Sir Gareth, and he makes him work in the kitchen. And the meaner that Sir Kay is, the nicer Sir Gareth or, or uh, Sir Gareth is, and that makes Sir Kay even meaner. It's, and I felt like that read so true. Like yeah. that is so true in life. It reminds me a lot of there was a book I read. The Sherwood Ring, I love it so much. It's a historical fiction romance. Mm. And um, there is, I won't give too many spoilers, but there are two characters, uh, and one of which, one has come and uh, to back to this you know, little farm. He thinks he's so great, so amazing. And here's this, uh, you know, here's the girl that you know, scrub mud in his face when he was 12, and they have exactly that. He gets even more formal and distant and cold, and mm. she gets even more, as it goes on, even more aggressive and um, taunting and just rude. Um, we have another example of this with the, what is it, Lady Lynette in the same story? Yes. Mm. Yeah. She's horrible. Poor kitchen she's night. Horrible. She's trying. She's trying so hard to get this guy killed no. for so long. But and then, then all I, of a sudden, I felt like she's I felt like when she let up so sudden. She's just like, "Fine, all right, I'm not gonna be mean anymore. I'm sorry." Yeah, I know. She finally, and then it's she finally, it's like, "Okay, well, fine. You beat like three of them. I guess you're cool now." <laughs> it's crazy. Um, fine, whatever. Strudel Kitty, did you see Dracon's question about the Sherwood Ring? Is it like lamb to the slaughter? No. No. Okay. I don't. I don't know where this came from. It's not like lamb to the slaughter at all. It's um. Okay. Well, the answer. The best is way I'm gonna describe it is like. I would liken it closer to His Maj Majesty's Dragon, uh, in the style of writing. Um, and then it's got this uh, romance, 
it's kind of set halfway between um, halfway between modern times and between historical times. And I love it very much. Okay, well, I'm gonna have to read it. So I think I like this story the least of all eight of the stories, but it's got one of my very favorite morals, which is you can't judge people based on who you think they are. Mm -hmm. And and that the most humble person can end up being like the best. Like he's- Wait, he's this is getting, one of your least favorite? Yeah, this, this is, is one, one of my favorite. favorites out of the second part. Well, there you go. <laughs> this there one. This one I think has it's my least favorite reference. because I hate her so much. Yeah. Well, but it does highlight yet another chivalric upgrade. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which is when Gareth invents the concept of ignoring angry women. <laughs> <laughs> Lady, said Sir Gareth gravely, a knight who could not put up with hard words from a woman would be of little worth. <laughs> And if this upgrade had been carried through to the rest of the <laughs> round table, we might have seen Camelot not fall. Oh, that's interesting. Well, you like, know, there was that saying, he who angers you controls you. Yeah. The, and so the, thing, the other thing I thought interesting was a reference to modern gang warfare. So modern. There's, a phrase, there's a phrase you find in the ghetto that you're going to put somebody's shoes out, which means kill them. And then you can throw their shoes over the electric or the telephone wires hanging there to say, yeah, we kill people here, by the way, those were their shoes. And these knights, almost all of them do that exact uh, same thing. They hang up the shields and then the yeah. big bad black knight, the worst of the worst, the scariest of them all, no, sorry, red knight. Red knight takes a step further. He just throws up the corpses, but mm -hmm. most of the other ones, they're evil, but they only threw up the shield. I'm getting a very Iliad vibe here. Hector oh, yeah. riding his chariot around, dragging the corpse of. Uh, well, here's the picture Sobbing. of the mothers of Sparta, where mm. they would send their sons off of their shield and say, "Either come home with your shield or yeah. on it." My dad loves yeah. that phrase. Yeah. yeah it's um, a... So that's interesting. We I think it's crazy. I have that picture right here at my desk. We can enlighten oh. that phrase slightly. Um, Greek, Greek shields back then were super heavy, heavy enough that if you had one, you would be noticeably slower than somebody who didn't. So if you fled the field of battle, you leave your shield behind and the guys chasing you have to keep their shield so you can get away. But then they take your shield. Okay. All right. So All right. Then we get to the story of Tristram and the fair Isolde or Tristan and Isolde. This story is super important because it is foundational it is like the quintessential tale of star-crossed lovers. It is. It has been turned into an opera. Actually, my like friend Sue Hamilton sang in this opera of Tristan and oh. Isolde. Um, it is a billion books. It's in a billion languages. That isn't even hyperbole. It's in <laughs> songs. It's in art. Like you cannot. You you can hardly find a story not influenced by the story of Tristan and Isolde. And in this story, he's said to be one of the best knights of all, because of course, best. And he plays the harp and he sings, which is super important to the story. But it's also interesting to me because music isn't one of the qualities any other of the knights are said to have. That's true. Um, and he, yeah, and he ends up in the court of King Mark, not knowing that it's his uncle, so mistaken identity for the win yet again. And then this bad guy, Sir Marhalt, tries to take over and Sir Tristram kills him after he slaps a glove in his face, which is for some reason the universal sign of like insult, right? Like I, if I slap a glove in your face, we are having a duel. And um, this leads to a big problem because he falls in love with the sister of the guy who then is furious at him for killing her brother, which harkens back to the thing that Jonathan mentioned earlier, which is like, why'd you kill my brother? Because he was a bad dude, right? <laughs> and um, there's this line that really stuck with me. Um, it's on page 184 and it says, <laughs> this is funny, Drake. <laughs> you know, like you're hanging up the laundry, but you're hanging up just the corpses of your enemies. <laughs> well, it also, it also says how quickly he's killing them that they're still intact. Yeah corpses hanging in the trees because like exactly. yeah. <laughs> they're not rotted they're not eaten by crows it says um tristan 
Tristram in Lioness wrought many deeds till his fame was carried through the world. But ever he loved Isolt, the queen of Cornwall, and ever she loved him and hated Mark. And I'm like, I just think well, that's Mark, so sad. And it says in his like, Mark is her husband. And it says on page 187, always he sorrowed for the love of Isolt the fair with a love and with a sorrow that no time might heal. And I think that is really like, I, I object to that being the epitome of love where you don't love your spouse because you want to be with this other person, but you pride yourself on your honor because you haven't actually like left. Oh, strudel kitty with the hat. Okay. Then I'm I mean, he's a bard, you know, he's got his liar, you know? So this is my bard hat. I am my Merlin hat. Perfect. So if you have a baseball cap, read this story, be sure to read it because there's this super cool part at the end that's pretty mean on the part of his wife, of, of the of the woman oh. who ends up marrying Tristan. That is great. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, are let's we, talk about it. Skip over the Thunderdome, though? Wait, what? The Thunderdome. Now. Two men enter, one man leaves. Like, this is the source. This is the original, the OG. Mad Max, Mad Max was a thousand years behind the times. These guys, yeah. yeah, the guy's just like, why'd you burn your boat? And he's like, because only one of us is living through this. <laughs> Michael, why don't you recap this part of the story for us where at the end, because you had a reaction to this. So he marries a different Isolde. Um, I don't know why he marries a different Isolde, yeah. but. How crazy is that? that? Sort of funny. Like, I'm so lonely. I need to find somebody else who has the same name as my beloved. Um, but he he gets sick. I, I don't remember how he gets sick. Isn't he wounded a, he's in wounded. some way during battle? They're or all wounded. Right. He's wounded. And then he's like, only my love can heal me. Allow me to to send for her. And he sends for her. And, and she goes through all the... the uh, proper channels and she she races to heal her love and then his uh we have this very very um this very Greek mythology moment again where Isolde the the wife of Mark is traveling in this ship with uh with Tristan's servant and they are supposed to put up white sails if Isolde's on the boat black sails if she's not and Isolde, Tristan's wife, reports to him that the ship is bearing black sails, and Tristan dies dramatically. So we have However, a very yes moment here. However, Isolde dead. does arrive, and then she dies of grief naturally. But then his wife feels bad about it, and so right. she has them buried together. <laughs> I just, I just object to this being the epitome of love because it's not hard at all to be in love with someone you don't really have to live with in real life who doesn't have any, like, you don't have to do the day to day. You're never arguing about who takes out the trash or who the equal distribution of chores. You never have anything. It's so fake to me and it's so mean to their actual spouses. And I want to vote this story off the island, oh, even though uh, it's like there's some, there's some elements here that are pretty important to note. First of all, after he marries Isolde 2.0, <laughs> he is 100% faithful to her indeed. Hmm. So that's a key point. Second of honor, he was injured to the point of death, saving his wife's brother. Okay. Yeah, and he was right. wounded by poison. Third of all, they didn't voluntarily fall in love. And admittedly, that's a theme, but like yeah. they were legitimately ensorcelled into that's this situation. True. Right. That's true. The or, one thing I would say is that the idea that it's what they did, it falls apart later because we get this. Um, they did actually do something bad against the one up against Mark. Yeah. They were, they're messing around before is sold to 2.0. Yeah. I think that um, there's this important part though, where Both it says, other people's wine. <laughs> let's see, where is it? It's like, where it says something about, oh, it's this is in the story of Percival, but it says, not in great deeds of arms lies the true worth of knighthood, rather in the heart of the doer of such deeds. If he be pure and humble, doing all things to the glory of God and to bring that glory and that peace 
throughout all our holy kingdom of logress. And I love this idea that it's not about what you do. It's about why you do it and mm -hmm. what happens because of it. Um, I like this insight by Cloudfall. Um, off the island, off right. the island. Right. <laughs> yeah, I don't. In fact, I said that I did like that. Bang on the table. I like that other story the least, but I'm going to go with Tristan's old. Well, oh, we're not done yet, though. So then you've got the white sails, black sails thing, which would be unmistakably a reference to, if I recall correctly, Theseus. Yep, Theseus and Aegeus. Yep. So, so they're tying in that like fatherly, like son, like love for father, for son, they're tying in, they're saying mm -hmm. like, this is the most intense moment. And if you're talking about why people like this guy, let's remember that Severus Snape has a fan base. And I Tristan- can't be persuaded he's bad. And Tristan pulls off an absolute like boom, Forget Romeo, forget anything. This guy is the best, most faithful person. <laughs> when he sees the black sails, a key point is in Theseus' story, black sails mean he's dead, mm -hmm. means he can't come back. In this story, black sails mean she will not come. She chose not. So he sees black mm -hmm. sails and he knows, because he believes his wife, she said she abandoned him. To yeah. death. This after, is a story that just after like, he was poisoned, like after he was poisoned to death, saving her brother. This is worse this than lady, Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> yeah, no, so, sorry, but like this woman, his love, so it sold at 1.0. She has abandoned him to death, and he at the end is just like, Man, I just wish I could have seen her before I died. I mean, that's that's some intense level dedication and devotion there. He's like, she literally betrayed me to death. She wouldn't come save me when she could have, because the ship is there, which means she would have made it in time if the ship had white sails, right? Like yeah. you could not conceive of a more complete betrayal as what he knows her to have done. And he still totally, doesn't even say I forgive you. He's just like, it doesn't even matter. Like I just wish you could have seen her. I, I don't think, think you can necessarily put this down to Tristan's morals though, if whether he's, just a, a really dedicated person at heart because he was potioned into it, right? So, I mean, this is all the potion talking. <laughs> yeah, well, but, uh, like, you I'm guys have, have redeemed this here. story a little bit in my mind. It is definitely more complex. And I think Dracon's right. Like, this is basically every star-crossed lover love story ever told. So let's look at I the story of Geraint <laughs> and Enid or Geraint and Enid. And Grant shows up at court with a story of a white stag. Arthur really wants it. Another and Grant stag. fights for the oh. honor of Guinevere and Enid. But just like Gareth, Enid's super mean to him. And I wonder, like, I, when you were reading this story, it's like, haven't we heard this before? Wasn't that Lynette person like this no, too? I'm... And I feel like this is where the whole idea that guys want girls who are mean to them, like, guys always go after the mean girls. <laughs> and that is a thing. Like, not yeah. only was I in high school, but I taught high school, and I saw this all the time, where guys would date the meanest girls, and the nice girls, they wouldn't go out with. And I'm like, you guys are stupid. And now I understand why. It's because they were taught it in Arthurian legend. Mm. So real quick, the white stag motif keeps showing up, and that is also a C.S. Lewis thing, right? Yes. Because the- And a Harry Potter persona thing. thing. Yeah. Yeah, I was just writing down like, what is with all these albino deer? <laughs> and why does, albino every, by face. why does every those, albino yeah. deer in the entirety of the kingdom, all of Logres, why does every albino deer have to go within five miles of King Arthur's court at a feast day? Right. Like, right. What is this? I, I want to say isn't about the. Isn't there a second uh, occurrence There's of white deer appearing? Yeah. Yeah, there's there's so many white deer. And they go all go near there. his court. They all go close enough to his court that you can catch them. <laughs> court. It's like, or they're in his court and then they leave his court. <laughs> they right, sometimes yeah. just you know, walk in and like, hey guys. Um, I do want to mention though about the ladies and all that. Um, one thing I like 
is the Middle English. I've been I've been thinking about this like ever since I read it. The, the Middle English usage of the word saucy to mean like like rude. Like I'm imagining this old wise and weathered man, you know, like Merlin. And he, he looks down to his this impudent young squire. He says, young man, you have reached, this is no marinara matinee. You have reached your Bernays barrier with me. I have, like, you will rue the day you were born. Like, it's just, it's just one of those words I can't take seriously. <laughs> and every time. Yeah. Well, the story of Sir Gawain and Lady Ragnall is one of my favorite stories of all time. Um, not just in this book, but this is one of my favorite stories. And so, well, I, when I was growing up, well, I mean, I'm still growing up, but when I was much younger, we had a bunch of picture books around. One of them was the tale of Sir Lancelot. One of them was this, the tale of, what's his name? And Lady Bracknell, sorry, not Bracknell. That's the wrong book, Lady Ragnall. And I feel like we had another one, but while I was reading this story, I was getting all of these flashbacks where they used similar language to depict the same scenes. And it was funny and nostalgic, more so than I thought it would be. That is in that interesting. And then those visual images just get so imprinted. You could probably see the pictures in your mind. Of, yeah, it could. <laughs> yeah, what it looked like. It's really powerful. And so they had some illustrations in the copy of the book I had. A oh, it's too bad you don't yeah. still have it. You could show it to us. Um, I think I still do, but it's buried somewhere. You know what? I'll try to find it next to class. Try to find it for next time. So I love this story because it's about how Sir Gawain, in order to save Arthur, agrees to marry this super ugly hag and because she makes this deal that if she saves Arthur, then she gets to marry a knight. And Gawain ends up married to her and everybody else just feels so bad for him, but he's given it a hundred percent. Like he doesn't act like he's sad. He doesn't act crazy. And on their wedding night, he gives her a kiss and the spell is like half broken. So mm. now she tells him like, Oh, I, you've broken half the spell. So I can be beautiful 12 hours a day. Do you want me to be beautiful? Like at night when we're alone, or do you want me to be beautiful in the day when other people see me? So then they think you married someone beautiful. And he tells her, oh, you get to choose. And because he lets her choose, then it breaks the spell 100% and she's gorgeous all the time. And the gorgeous part annoys me, like that that's the most important thing. But I like the idea that he's willing to see beyond how ugly she is. I feel like that's really the better part of honor. Mm -hmm. And I think I love that about the story. But one thing that's interesting in this story is that Arthur gives um, Gawain his weapons to fight. And it's like, his sword Excalibur, which we must admit is a way cool name, but his spear's name, his spear's name is Ron. Ron, <laughs> Ron Weasley. Hey, I mean, I so lame. <laughs> well, here's, there is something to bear in mind here, which is that modern English is probably one of the only languages spoken by more than a million people, you know, like one of the only big languages. And you have Chinese. Where but, names, uh, don't really have intrinsic meaning. And people, oh, names yeah. do, names yeah. do. You, you've got name, plenty of names that have a meaning, but nobody mm -hmm. says Michael. It, it's not a word, it's just a name. Yeah. Like, yeah. Gemert means something in it its original. It has some historical in meaning, English, but other than that, yeah. And Gemert is just a name. And so when they say Ron, I think we might be putting a little too much attachment on it being a name name. Yeah. Instead of a cool name. I just don't think it's cool. Like, I'm not sure they had as separate of a thing. Like, what if Ron meant, what if Ron means something cool? Like, what does Ron even mean? Well, the Magic 8-Ball says that yes. Ron is cool. It says yes, definitely, but I'm not. Cool. Dolor is the spear. Oh, my goodness. What does Ron mean? It means, yeah, so Ron means song of joy, which is a bit weird uh, to name a spear. In, yeah. Latin, okay. it means, in Latin, it means uh, ruler. Decision. Oh, okay. Well, this is which makes sense to an extent since you really would decide quite a few things with a lance back then. True. Like, mm -hmm. like imagine if you named it judgment. Like judgment. we'd be okay with that, and that's practically right. what it means. So one thing I want to do with Ron. <laughs> it's like mm, here, my shield. 
uh, Excalibur and my yes. mighty sword. He draws it out. It's jeweled. Yeah. It's beautiful. Well, I had this moment to pause like, and reread it. <laughs> fall at my blade, Bobbert. Bobbert. So the story so thing, of Sir Percival. One thing that I really liked oh. was Green's description. His like vivid description of Lady Ragnall. He goes on and oh, yeah. on. Yeah, and, and like, 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 it's like, man, but you gotta know, <laughs> she it's ugly. Like, the teeth, <laughs> the teeth and the hair and the face and yeah. It's the whole thing because it's her voice so, too. He uses mm. a lot of really superlative um, comparisons. Like, I don't know what they all were. I don't know if I can find them here, but uh, <laughs> hold on just a sec. I think hard. I. Um, While you're finding okay. that, I'm just going to move ahead. Okay, for a here second. we go. Oh, you got it? <laughs> for she was the loathliest lady that ever the eye of man rested upon. Her face was as red as the sinking sun, and long yellow teeth showed between wide, weak lips. Her head was set upon a great thick neck, and she herself was fat and unshapely as a barrel. Yet the horror of her seemed to lie in something more than the hideousness of her looks. For in her great, squinting, red-brimmed eyes there lurked a strange and terrifying shadow of fear and suffering. Yeah. Also, what it was like what really caught me as well about that scene is that behind her eyes, it was terrifying that she was in agony. Mm -hmm. And I think that's interesting. The kind of like paralyzing fear of someone in pain. Mm. Uh, different scenes, different places, they often will bring up the scariest person is in the greatest pain. Mm. Serenus thinks that's a really interesting insight. Yeah. He wanted to come and say that. As, as one key side note, though, the whole barrel comment that they made. <laughs> um, for whatever reason, if you ever check out some of the King Arthur songs where they're just like, oh, what kind of woman are we gonna try and hook up the king with? <laughs> At the time period, they were really big about the hourglass waist thing. Mm -hmm. And so for her to be a barrel shape, like the opposite. literally no waist, completely straight from the shoulder to the hip. Well, right? That must have been worse than the face. Cannot, cannot, or even wider, potentially. Yeah, They're effectively saying Any she's- bowed. Yeah. <laughs> No, it's not just that she's ugly. She can't even give you kids. Like there's there's no element that women are expected of in marriage that she can satisfy. Like, yeah, there's like no redemptive possibility here. So in the story of Sir Percival, this story that's thrown near, here near the end is super important because in this version, Percival is the son of Sir Gawain or Sir Gawain. So and I feel like these last two stories in this second book were really short. I don't know why. Yeah, I think but, they were shorter than the others. And I think they were almost put there just to like prove the point. Um, and like of what, like we need to make sure that we cover who Percival and Lance, like we got to get Galahad in here and we got to get Lancelot in here. So, um, I mean, we had Lancelot earlier on his first quest and Lan Lancelot and Gawain are the only two knights who get two stories. So that's interesting. But in, in Sir Percival, He's the purest knight. He's the one who ultimately sits in the Siege Perilous. And in most versions of it, it's not mentioned here, um, but in most versions, uh, his sister is the one who carries the grail, which yeah, is really. one of the few times where a woman, it's like she's the purest, like that she can carry that. Fun fact, in Harry Potter, Percival Dumbledore is Albus Dumbledore's father. Oh, Oh, so one thing I thought was kind of cool. I saw something about Harry Potter, but I can't remember all the names. They were pointing out that they were joking about how I like they like how uh, Molly Weasley may, named all of her children Ron, Bill, uh, Fred, George, and then suddenly she just goes off on a limb, and her youngest is named Geneva. Right. And they were pointing out that they are all diminutives of the Knights of the Round Table, and Geneva is Guinevere. Guinevere. And I was like, oh, makes Illusion sense. For the win. Um, One thing I liked here was that these stories tied in. And it's even more funny if Percival's sister is um, the one who carries the grail because Percival was the son of Gawain and Lady Ragnall, right? Mm -hmm. And at the end of the story, um, Green says that it's uh, like a rumor that Ragnall uh, left Gawain after seven years and gave birth to Percival but could never return to Gawain. 
Like she may have had the daughter first yeah. and taken her. I yeah. wish he had given a more thorough explanation of that because that'd be kind of interesting to know. Like why did she have to leave after seven too. years? Doesn't really explain it. I think that um, I think that Green is fighting against the tension that exists between trying to tell the full story and not, I mean, it's already a fairly lengthy book and it's yeah. written for like teen readers. And so, but I, I almost wish he'd made like two volumes. I don't know. Or like, I don't and know. A more extended an version. An unabridged version. Yeah, an unabridged right. version that you could do. I mean, he says in the, uh, somewhere in the introduction or does it have a preface? Um, anyway, in the intro, uh, he does say that he had to cut out a lot, sort of Yeah, in that him. author's note. And so the while, last- Again, while a lot of the descriptions are really lengthy, a lot of them are very short and sort of unsatisfying. Agreed, and not just the descriptions, but also just the whole plot arc. Um, so the last story in this section is Lancelot and Elaine. And this story is, this in contained in this story is the beginning of the end because the downfall of Camelot slash Logris is here. And it starts with, I think what is really interesting, this old idea that idle hands are the devil's playground because the knights have less and less real stuff to do. And so they spend all their time just doing tournaments, but finding- Trying to find real finding, stuff. Yeah, finding less and less, um, less and less, uh, cause to prove their prowess. And I think it's such a powerful lesson here that we hate it when we have challenges in our lives and we hate it when stuff is hard, but without that opposition, without something to fight for, without that feeling that we belong to something bigger than ourselves that's of value and meaningful, we I just languish. What is uh, what's interesting about challenge is there's a very specific point of fun because if you have something that's really challenging but you're getting it that is amazing mm -hmm. like uh when there's something that's just on the very edge of your ability but you know you can do it or even if you don't know you can do it but somehow you're doing it and that's pretty cool uh that can be some of the most sort of fun and rewarding experiences that you can have getting really deep here uh, but Nietzsche's definition of joy is the overcoming of other wills Mm. And, yeah, I love that. So, and when you come across, and it's it's kind of weird why uh, people, some people become so obsessed with trying to make things easier that they forget that when things are easier, they're not as fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's such a powerful idea. I think it is one of the most important things in here that we need opposition. We need it or else our life just doesn't feel like it has any value and it can actually lead us into really dark paths. Is because it the human the bottom, they can go too far? Yes, it can go too far. In the bottom of page 250, it says, in this way, the first shadow of a great evil crept into Lagras so silently and so innocent in seeming that no one observed it, nor did either Lancelot or Guinevere dream whither it would lead but the powers of evil seeking now more and more desperately to find some tiny loophole through which to climb into the stronghold of good. So I love that personification of evil saw it and set up a cunning snare for Lancelot. And I feel like this goes to our first one of craving or not craving, but that evil is always trying to break in that evil will always find a way in it will. It, and I just thought that was really interesting. Also, when it says it set up a cunning snare for Lancelot, I think the idea is through all of these stories is this, this idea of entrapment and enchantment. Mm, there is a, on that. over and over and over again, we see entrapment and enchantment over and over and over again. And Lancelot is tricked by Elaine into thinking that she's Guinevere and he sleeps with her. And then he's so distraught with guilt that he just wanders for years. And Elaine ends up killing herself in a scene that is highly reminiscent of Ophelia in Hamlet. And Lancelot tells Arthur that he feels badly about the fact that he doesn't love Elaine. And he says, but love can't be forced. And I think, well, that's interesting because Gawain did it. Like, not that he necessarily loved her, but he was willing, like, he right. was willing to himself uh, wholeheartedly. Uh, well, Arthur tells him, uh, love cannot be forced. And Lancelot's like, but all my friends are doing it. <laughs> <laughs> 
And I think that it's really interesting at the end of this story, it ends with this very ominous line. From their love, meaning Guinevere and Lancelot, came at length the passing of the glory of Logris. And I think it's like, what does it say about your relationship that you bring down a whole utopia? <laughs> Just like, Heaven on earth, this relationship, bring it down. <laughs> it's yes. so dysfunctional that um, you've just single-handedly destroyed um, America's status as a superpower. It's it's just gone. Utopia is now times. an end. It's your fault. <laughs> it's your fault. Yeah, which I guess tells you it's very important to um, pick the right relationship or you could be responsible for the downfall of all of society. Yeah. Don't fall in love yeah. with the emperor's wife. Exactly. Do not fall in love. <laughs> not fall in love with the emperor's wife. I mean, it's well, okay to fall in love with the emperor's wife either. if he's not also in love with you. I dropped well, away my sentence. Uh, I didn't really mean to, but I ended up just saying, do not fall in love. <laughs> no, you you can honestly. That sounds like an okay moral for these stories. <laughs> I think you could get that from them. Well, in the next in next week or not next week, but next class, which will be in two weeks, we will read book three, the quest of the Holy Grail, much shorter than this one. Um, so if you will read that, and that will be two weeks from today, so the sixteenth. I believe. Yep. And um, so I want to thank you, Strudel Kitty Michael and Jonathan, for yeah, all joining you. me on the call. And then, um, and then look at Cloudfall. That sounds like a good ending line there. <laughs> we shall see, I suppose. Right? Nice. Um, uh, Cloudfall, yeah, not buying it. Um, <laughs> and uh, I want to thank you guys for joining. Again, those of you who are here tonight, if you want to join in, shoot me an email and um, we can do more people in here. But those of you who are in the chat, very much appreciate you too. And I hope that you all have a wonderful holiday weekend. We're recording this on um, July 2nd. So we're starting in to celebrate our 4th of July weekend. And it really does feel like a weekend of freedom as we have like last year during the 4th of July, it didn't feel that free. The country was in almost solid lockdown. Um, for a pandemic. And so there's definitely some feeling of it coming back. And so I hope that you all have a wonderful, wonderful time. You know, it's sort of funny. This class yeah. and the next two actually happen to line up with my biweekly paycheck for uh, the next month and a half. Sort of funny. Well, that's very good. So you get like paid and have a cool thing to do. It's amazing. So that is awesome. Uh, Jacob, thank you so much. Thank you all. Appreciate you. Um, yeah, thank you for us. Appreciate you so much. And so we will see you guys next time. Cool. All righty. <laughs>